And so, if you be opening your Bible to Acts chapter 2, we're actually going to look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10, but we'll start there in Acts chapter 2. Um, we are in the midst of a study of the Holy Spirit, and hopefully you're, you're getting some, some things out of it that are helpful. I've had some good compliments and comments, and I appreciate those. Uh, it is a, an interesting study. Uh, we don't say a lot about the Holy Spirit. We should say more than what we'll, oh, sorry, Larry. Thank you. should say more than, than what we do. But I think there's a lot of reasons for why we don't. I think it's – I may give you two or three there. Sorry. Um, I think one of the reasons why we don't say a lot about it is because there's a lot of confusion in the world. I think another reason is because we don't know everything, maybe. And, and, and it, some of the things with regards to the Holy Spirit, granted, it's just difficult. And it's hard to understand. And there's maybe more discussion and, and more uh, differences with regards to it than we would like to admit. But yet, at the same time, too, it is a biblical subject. One of the things, though, that is discussed in religious circles today is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the reason being because of many of the evangelicals will tell you, you know, you must be or you should be or you ought to be baptized, depending upon who you talk to, that you ought to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that if you're baptized, that that's the baptism that you want. That is the confirmation that uh, truly have been converted. And then that, according to them, that baptism gives you the ability to perform spiritual, some of the spiritual gifts. Uh, I won't be here next week. I'll just, and I don't mean to offend you, but I will be getting prepped for a colonoscopy on Thursday of next week. So somebody else will be speaking next Wednesday night. Uh, my my prep starts at four o'clock, so I request your prayers because I ain't looking forward to it. I've had it, I've done it once before. Yeah, huh, I don't. I, I I did it when I was fifty. Now I'm doing it when I'm sixty. And the only reason is because it's in my family, and I, but I got a good report at fifty, so I got to wait ten years. But um, and I hate that. I really I, after it was all scheduled and said and done, I thought, oh, I messed up on that. But thankfully. Uh, got folks that understand and I appreciate that so but then we will start then the week after and I want to look at spiritual gifts and some other things with regards to, to things that are talked about in conjunction with the Holy Spirit but we will not get to cover everything and every thought with regards to this but I want you to understand what's out there as opposed to what the scriptures teach what's out there is the the thought the belief that well, as one one uh, evangelical preacher that I was listening to last week, I believe it was, I was listening to him, and he said, you've got to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I thought that was interesting. Because how do you do that? How does that, go about, how does that go about happening? And I wonder if he understood, if he had really studied this. And I'm not saying I have all the answers, don't get me wrong. But I want us to look at what the text says, and I want us to think about these things, and I want us to exactly what's going on. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Acts chapter 2. And some of this I'm just going to kind of run through very quickly because um, I need to finish it tonight, and I don't want to bore you, but at the same time, there's a lot of things to catch with regards to this. When you think about the Holy Spirit, you got to understand that baptism of the Holy Spirit and indwelling of the Holy Spirit are two separate and different things. Two separate things. Baptism of the Holy Spirit only happened in, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. Now, there are those, yea, even in our own brotherhood. Uh, brother, I was reading Brother Jimmy Jividen. If you've ever read this book, I think you can find it like on Amazon or probably find it in McKay's every once in a while. Uh, Brother Jividen did a tremendous work here entitled Alive in the Spirit, Study the Nature and Work of the Holy Spirit, where Brother Jividen says that that there's the possibility that baptism of the Holy Spirit, based upon Titus chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6, uh, occurred more than in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10, but we only have it in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. Now, 
some other things that he says with regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit are, are worth reading, but uh, that's uh, that was an interesting thought. We only have it in Acts 2 and Acts chapter 1, and I'm not so sure that based upon Titus 3 that there were more, but Brother Jividen said his thoughts, he believed that there were. But in, in both of them, what you have is a miraculous event that occurred with a purpose and a reason, and that reason being basically confirmation. Let's look at them. Let's think about it. In Acts chapter 2, we have what is called baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want it to, to catch a drift. When you begin in Acts chapter 2, we begin reading in Acts chapter 2, don't we? As a matter of fact, uh, this month, month of January, I'm reading this year, uh, just select books, books that I want to focus on. And each day, I'm just reading a chapter and concentrating on a chapter. And so I'm reading the book of Acts. And I was reading the other day at Acts 2, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Let's think about this for a minute. Because it begins this way, and you can read along with me. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they. Who's the they? Right? That's where we start, Acts 2. We always start at the beginning of a chapter. They. Well, in grammar, you have to go to what's called the nearest antecedent, or the nearest pronoun, or the nearest noun, to find out who they is, or are. Well, back, look back in verse 26. Because remember, when Luke wrote this, Luke did not write in chapters and verses. He just wrote a book. And so in verse 29, he says, and they cast their lots. Well, who's the they? Well, it's the apostles. They were trying to, to take or, or to figure out who was going to take the place of Judas, who had, remember, had hung himself. And so they were down to 11. And so they are going about to choose somebody and they are choosing Matthias, because notice what it says, and they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, who's they? It goes back to who was mentioned in the verse before, the apostles. When they, were caught, when they were all with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there, then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Now, what's happening? These folks don't really know. But go back with me. Go back with me to Matthew. Hold your finger there and go back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John makes the state, or Jesus, or rather, excuse me, the statement is made. This is, remember, about the time that uh, Jesus is going to be baptized. And John is out preaching the wilderness, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The promise then, that's made there and made again. Now you go back to probably the same opening in your Bible. Look in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus told the apostles, stay in Jerusalem. Remember now, he has died, he has resurrected, he has preached, he has been there walking among them for many days now, and he telling the apostles, I want you to stay in Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, in Acts chapter 2, we have 
what had been talked about by John in Matthew chapter 3 and what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 3, John made the statement that Jesus was going to administer upon the people a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the apostles, stay here in Jerusalem and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, that's what happens. They are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's stop right here and let, let's make a, a, a side point. When we think of baptism, we think of immersion in water for the remission of sins, right? But there are some six baptisms mentioned in the New Testament. There's the baptism of Moses. There's the baptism of John. There's the baptism of fire. There's the baptism, uh, some even baptism of Jesus as a separate one. But there's what we call Christian baptism, which would be the the uh, the Great Commission baptism. You have all of these baptisms. Baptism just doesn't simply mean to dip, to immerse, to plunge or to plunge under, but it has also the idea of to be overwhelmed, to be overtaken. And so this baptism, and that's the, that would be the Greek word, there's a difference between baptizo, to dip, to plunge, and baptism, baptismo, which is the, the, the noun form, which is being used here. And so he says, the promise, though, is that you're going to be overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. Well, in Acts chapter 2, that's what happens. Now, I want you to notice, I want you to notice, notice a couple of things here. N notice, first of all, that the apostles are there gathered together. And notice, secondly, if you go down to verse 2 and verse 3, you all of a sudden you hear this activity that falls upon the apostles the cloven tongues, the, the wind that comes about, the whole room being filled, and these men are able to speak in tongues. And then, look at verse 6, then the multitude came together. The Holy Spirit only fell on the apostles. It fell on the preachers. It did not fall upon others. Now, there are some that if you go back in chapter Hundred and twenty, and so some would say, well, it has reference to the hundred and twenty. You got to go far back into that chapter to have reference to the hundred and twenty. You've got a reference to 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 Judas, who, who's not there. You've got a reference to the apostles. You got a reference to Matt, Matthias, and like I say, if you find a pronoun, you find its nearest antecedent that was before it, nearest noun we would call it in order to understand who the pronoun's talking about. So who's they talking about? Well, verse 26 of the first chapter, we found out. It's the apostles. Apostles gather together. They're able to speak in tongues. Then the group gathers together, and they hear. Now, this was not something that should have been, at least to the apostles, that strange. You might say, well, wait a minute. Anytime you can speak in tongues, anytime you can speak in a language that you haven't studied, you ought to be amazed. But they knew that it was going to take place. They knew that it was going to happen. Probably didn't know it was going to happen that day. Probably didn't know it was going to happen then and exactly how it was going to happen. And so they began to speak. And when they talk, if you go down to verse 17, you find out that one of the things that Peter tells them is that this is a fulfillment of Joel, or what Joel said in Joel chapter 2, in which verse 17 and 18, it says, And it came to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall, shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on the men's servants and maid servants, and I will pour out my spirit in those days, and, and they shall prophesy, and go on and, and so forth. You see all this. But, this is said to be a fulfillment of what Joel promised in Joel chapter 2. And so the Holy Spirit came upon those individuals, and they spoke in tongues. Now, we have a question. Why was this done? Well, think about 
who Peter was preaching to. He was preaching to the Jews, right? He was preaching to the Jews, and one of the things that they had to know was that God was willing to accept them through Christ. Imagine, if you will, for just a minute, that you're a Jew in the first century. You've heard about Jesus, and at least from a distance, you've not only heard about it, but maybe you've seen some things. You've gotten some reports of some miracles that he was able to do. You heard of some of his teachings, and you realize that even his life fulfilled some of the prophecies that your mama and your grandmama and your great-grandmama had told you about. And you're beginning to wonder, you know, maybe there's something to this guy. And maybe there's something to his teaching. I wonder if he's right. And in my Jewish heritage and background and belief, I'm wrong. How can I come to God? Will God allow me to come to him? Will God allow me to be saved? And the answer is yes. For really what this is, is an affirmation that the gospel's for all, that the gospel's for the Jew, and they're welcome to it. Now, go on and notice that as Peter and I know you know this, so we're not going to spend just a super amount of time reading this. But as Peter continues to preach, he preaches basically, he preaches Jesus. Which I found interesting. I was reading yesterday, Acts 3. I kind of like the sermon in Acts 3 better than I like the sermon in Acts 2. Not to say that the Acts 2 sermon is not a fantastic sermon. Acts 3 is just kind of an interesting sermon. Much the same as Acts 2. But nevertheless, that's a sideline. In Acts 2, when Peter preaches about Jesus and teaches about Jesus and tells these folks that, that Jesus of Nazareth, whom they crucified, God's made both Lord and, and, and Savior. And they ask the question, what must we do? What can we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You say, wait a minute. Is that the same thing that they got in in, in the first part of the chapter? And the answer is no. It's not the same. It's different. You see, there was this, there was baptism of the Holy Spirit, but then there was this water baptism in the end of Acts. The baptism which Jesus had told the, the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized should be saved. It believes not should be damned. And so you have an understanding that you have two baptisms in Acts 2. You have a miraculous baptism of the Holy Spirit, wherein the apostles were able to speak in a language or in languages which they did not know, which they had not studied. It would be as if I came in here and spoke French to you all. I have never studied the first word of French. Uh, I took Spanish, but that was 40 years, 40, uh, 41, 42 years ago. Uh, I've had Greek, but I did not take it to speak it. I took it to translate it. Big difference. And so these folks spoke in languages. Now, if I came in here and spoke French to you, y'all would think, well, first of all, he's lost his mind. But then if you could speak French, you might say, he's speaking my language, especially if you were from France. These folks heard languages which they knew they these apostles had never studied, but they could speak them because they were gathered around from all places. And so the miracle occurred in the speaking of tongues. But the water baptism, which they were told to partake in, was for the remission of their sins. He preached according to Romans 6, 3, 4, and other passages. Different. Now, I want you to note something that the evangelicals today will tell you 
that if you did not receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized. Now, that's interesting because the Bible tells us in Acts 2.38 that we repent, baptized, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we confirmed here a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 5 that that gift had to be the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, some of the evangelicals today will say, well, you've got to ask for if you didn't receive it at baptism. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, do you know the Bible never tells you to ask for the Spirit? Isn't that interesting? The Bible never tells you ask for the Spirit in order to receive it. The second thing is, is that you got a problem. Look with me, and if, hold, your, hold your place in Acts 2, but go over to Ephesians chapter 4. This is a passage that once you see it, you'll say, I, I remember that. Unless you've studied it recently, then you could probably quote it to me. But in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about how that uh, as a prisoner of the Lord, he said, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called with all lowliness of mind, meet with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and bond of peace. And then he says, there's one body and one spirit, just as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism. Your friends, today, there's only one baptism. There's not many. There's not two. There's not three. There's not the six that we talked about that are mentioned in the, the pages of the New Testament. And, and, and I meant to say this. There are some that throw in, like say, a seventh one, the baptism of Jesus. There are some that even throw in an eighth one. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and you talk, it talks about baptism for the dead. But that's really more in line with Christian baptism or, or the Great Commission baptism. Whole different subject. Be glad to talk to you about it sometime. But not tonight or not in this lesson. But you, what you have here then is we need to know which one we need. Do we need the Holy Spirit baptism or do we need the water baptism? Because Paul says in Ephesians 4, there's only one baptism. We need the baptism which the Lord tells us we must undertake in order to be buried with him, in order to rise up to walk as a new creature. And that would be the Great Commission baptism, water baptism, Christian baptism, ever how you want to frame it, whatever title you want to give it. That's what we need. So then we get back to Acts 2. Well, why, what, why, why were they baptized? Why were the apostles speaking in tongues in Acts 2? I think it was to confirm to the Jew that the gospel was for them. Any questions, comments, disagreements? Agreements. All right, well, let's flip over to Acts chapter 10. From Acts 2 to Acts 10, forward in your mind about 10 years. Some even say 11 years, so 10, 11 years. So there's there's been... A lot of things happen. There's been a lot of water under the bridge, as the old saying goes. Now in <clears throat> excuse me, in Acts chapter 10, you have a second time in which Holy Spirit baptism occurs. Yes, promised. Again, Joel chapter 2. This time it's different. Let's, uh, we're not going to be able to read, but let me encourage you. Go back and read tonight when you get home or tomorrow, whenever your next uh, time of study is. Read all of the 10th chapter and read at least the first 18 verses of the 11th chapter. It'll make more sense to you after I run through and butcher it. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get, be able to follow it. But uh, there was a man by the name of Cornelius, a certain, excuse me, let me read it as it says. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion called the Italian regiment, a devout man, one who feared God, with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, let's come to a conclusion about Cornelius. A good man. A religious man. We will find out a little later on in Acts chapter 10, wrong, 
but still a religious man, a good man. He, he'd be like, you know, he'd be, say, like a neighbor. Maybe you got a neighbor that's not a member of the church. Maybe he doesn't go to church anywhere. Not religious, but he's he's a good guy. You know, he's fairly moral. He's a good neighbor. You don't hear or see anything out of him. Police aren't over at his house every while. He's just a good guy. He just doesn't believe the way you believe. Well, Cornelius is what would be considered then a Gentile. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. Remember, in in their way of thinking at that point in time, either Jew or Gentile, and he's considered he would be considered a Gentile. Good man, but he's he has a vision, and we're going to jump through some of this, like I say, and and hopefully you'll go step. It. But he has a vision, and basically. Uh, his vision is is you need to send some folks and they need to go find Peter. They need to go find Simon, he calls him, whose surname is Peter, verse 5. And so the next day they go out. Or he, uh, Cornelius sends them out and they go and they find Peter. Well, at the same time, Peter has this vision. And, and like I said, at the beginning in verse 10, Peter talks about the sheet that comes down, the unclean animals that are on it. The Lord tells him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh. I hadn't eaten anything that's unclean because Peter, remember, hmm, background, Jew. And so he says, nah, no, no, I hadn't done that. And God says, basically, and look, look at first thing, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. I hope to um, let's see, on, on Wednesday nights, this is Acts is actually the book I want us to study next. I don't want us to go bit by bit. It'll take me forever to get through it. You'll see how I'm going to develop it when we get there. But one of the things we find out here is that Peter is learning right here is that everybody is of value to God. Everybody. Male, female, black, white. Doesn't matter the color, doesn't matter the nationality, doesn't matter the gender. Everybody's loved by God. Everybody should be appreciated by God. And he is. And we should learn the same. We should learn to treat everybody fairly equally and with love and respect. And so Peter is learning that. And so look at verse 17. Peter kind of wondered about this vision within himself. Uh, he, he wanted to know what it meant. Well, then Simon's ambassage came, or Cornelius, excuse me, ambassage came and, and told Peter what they were sent for. And Peter says, well, that's interesting. And Peter's beginning now together. Oh, got it. I see what's going on. And so Peter goes to the house. And beginning in verse 34, it says, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God has shown no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him works righteousness is accepted by him. And the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And so he begins to, to teach Cornelius truth. He begins to talk about Jesus to him. And as he preaches Jesus to him, jump on down, jump on down. Uh, let's jump down to verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. Many as came to Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can any forbid water? that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him today a few days. I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice the fact that as Peter was preaching, it says the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Those to whom Peter is preaching, all of a sudden, they, they have this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And notice that it says that they too, verse 46, spoke in tongues. They magnified God. And so then the question is asked, verse 47, well, what about 
water baptism, if you will, Christian baptism for them. Can any forbid them to be baptized? Well, who's the them? Well, it's these people, if you will, Cornelius, his household, but it's the Gentiles. You see, it's interesting, and like I say, I know I'm just running, flying through it, but I want you to catch the gist of all that we're saying. Peter preached the first gospel sermon in Acts 2. Peter saw all the apostles speak in tongues. He understood the idea of speaking in tongues. He now understood the gift of the Holy Spirit. He understood the difference between the gift of the Holy Spirit and water baptism. Now he sent Cornelius. Cornelius is a good man. Cornelius is a Gentile. And Cornelius, as he's talking to him, all of a sudden, here's these guys. They're able to speak in tongues. And Peter says, oh, we got a match because of the vision that I saw God was trying to teach me, and what God was trying to teach me is that everybody's equal. Everybody. And so, we should certainly offer that great commission baptism to them. And so, Acts 10 is baptism of the Holy Spirit once again, but it's the offering of the gospel to the Gentiles. So, in other words, in the way the first would look at it, this is the confirmation that we can be baptized for the remission of our sins. But it came about because these folks spoke in tongues, all of a sudden Peter realized they're all right in the sight of God. Now, you might say, well, preacher, really? Really? Yeah. We'll keep reading in the 11th chapter. All of a sudden then, there are those Jews, if you will, there are others. That, notice what it says in, in chapter verse 1. Now, the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now, basically, it preached to the Jews. Now, all of a sudden, we're opening it up to the Gentiles. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. In other words, come over here, buddy. We need to talk to you. What do you mean allowing these folks in here? What do you mean allowing those Gentiles in? What do you mean teaching those Gentiles what to do to be saved? How in the world could you do that? And so that begins the conversation. Peter then explained to them what he had, what he saw with regards to vision and what happened. Jump on down then. In verse 15, Peter says, as he's still talking to these people, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us. As upon us. As upon us. Did you catch that? More than likely, that's referenced to Acts chapter 2. In the beginning, he says. At the beginning. At the beginning of what? Christian dispensation of the church and so he says he says the Holy Spirit fell on them as just like it did on us and he says then I remembered the word of the Lord how he said John indeed baptized with water but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ who was I that I could with and God. In other words, I couldn't stop God. And so when those that were contending with Peter heard this, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So, the second time that you have Holy Spirit baptism, it was to accept or to show the acceptance of the Gentiles. Now, if you look on your outline, you'll notice that it says under Acts 10, you'll see the purpose, the purpose of the baptism, the purpose of, of uh, the baptism with regards to Holy Spirit baptism. First of all, it was not to save. If you look in, in chapter 10, verse 6, and you look in especially verse 46, you see and realize that 
the Holy Spirit baptism there was not to save them. It was not until Peter told them with regards to verse 47, as he calls it, water. Who could forbid water that these should be baptized? It was not to give them faith. Faith comes by hearing, right? Romans 10, verse 17. And if you look in, in chapter 11, verse 15, you, you see the answer to that. It was not to purify their heart. Uh, go over and read chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. It was to make Cornelius acceptable to God. That's the purpose. And it's the purpose of, uh, of with regards to Acts chapter 10. So from a positive standpoint, the Holy Spirit came to bear witness uh, that the Gentiles did not have to become Jews in order to become Christians, Acts 10, 47 and 48. But it happened to prove to the Jews that they could become, that the Gentiles could become Christians. It was also to help Peter to try to bring the Gentiles to the church because now, now we get, now we understand why when we studied the book of Galatians, there was a meeting of the minds with regards to Peter and Paul and who, when Paul came to Peter, Peter told him to go what? Go preach basically to the Gentiles, right? Well, how could he tell him to do that? Because Peter, if you will, had seen and believed that the Gentiles could hear the word of God. So now all of a sudden we see the synthesis of the story and how it fits together. I know I just kind of passed over it because I knew I was coming back to it. And so it's revealed really that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. So today, does Holy Spirit baptism happen? No. Well, how many baptisms are there today? Well, we've already covered that. There's one. There's only one. Baptism for the remission of sins. Yeah, Lynn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, had they received the, the question was had they received the spirit, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of that, part of the answer to that question, I want to reserve for in a couple of weeks when we talk about spiritual gifts and how they were translated or given to others. The other part of it is, is I, I, I think my my own opinion is, is that their baptism was a baptism that at the time in which they were baptized was not valid. They were baptized basically under the Jewish law, and they need to be baptized under the Christian dispensation, Christian law. Right, right. But the the miraculous part of it, they received by the laying of hands, which was a transference of of a transference that could be done at that time, but can't be done today. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a couple of weeks. So just kind of reserve that part of it. But why were they baptized again? My thought is, if you go read all of the context in the text, that they were baptized, but it was probably, uh, uh, not probably, but it was the, the baptism that they were baptized with was not at the point in which they were baptized a valid baptism. Think about, here's something to think about. When did baptism come about? You don't? That's right. What in the Old Testament? There was a form of it from the standpoint of the laver and the cleansing there right in the courtyard of, of, of worship or the tent of meeting. But there was not baptism. Baptism itself, if you study the history of baptism, came up during that intertestamental period. And John began to practice it. That's what many scholars read in the book of Acts, that, that what I called a not a valid baptism, they were baptized with the baptism of John. It was after the cross, so to speak. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and minister of the Lord, both paid to the same contempt of time. The Holy Spirit was descended upon them. The third example is it came through the first. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Verse 17, Peter says, they received the same gift mm -hmm. we received mm -hmm. when we believed in mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. now, uh oh, wait a minute. But I believe, if I, if I read that, mm -hmm. just straight out, yeah. it says, the same Cornelius did and received the same gift mm -hmm. that the apostles received on by uh, speaking in tongues. And Peter said, We got it, we believe. Mm -hmm. well, what I believe was the Pentecost. Yeah, yeah. I received the same gift yeah. that Moraki was given to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I know in a couple of weeks you're going to hit on that considerable. Well, we're, yeah, because I'm going to talk about the spiritual gifts and how, how they were transferred and can no longer be transferred. But, yeah. You know, uh, right. Why did he say it? I don't know. Can't answer the why. Can't, can't answer the why. Right. No, I don't want either. I don't want either. Uh, I would probably say that the word believed there is is an encompassing of of an obedient faith, all faith, not just a, a faith. You will be endowed with power from all time. Mm -hmm. And we received that gift on the day of Pentecost. I believe exactly what he said was coming true. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah. Where are you talking about, Billy? Probably, it was probably, if you go back, well, 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 go back, well, go back to verse four, talks about the baptism of John, and so probably what happened is that they were baptized with the baptism of John when the Christian dispensation or Christian baptism goes, because understand, one of the things we have to understand is that by the time you get to Acts 19, time-wise, I'll have to go back and look it up. But there's been 12, 14, 14, 15 years. Hmm. Don't hold me to that. I'll have to go back and look it up. But let's say 10. There's been over 10 since Acts 2. And so there's been a period of time. And evidently what was happening was is that these folks were baptized in the baptism of John, probably in that time frame when they should have been baptized with the Great Commission baptism or Christian baptism, however how you want to term it. And they were not. But they were baptized with the baptism of John. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a whole different issue. Uh, I, I don't believe in rebaptism. You know why? There's only one. And and this is the answer I give people. Now, will I baptize a person the second time? Yes, yes. Uh, so see, y'all are looking at me like I have done that many times. Uh, because, and here's the reason: because if you were baptized the first time scripturally you wouldn't have to be but let's say for whatever reason and, and i will go on and and try to soothe the person's conscience by baptizing them 
But the second time, all we're doing is getting you wet. We're not rebaptizing you. Now, if the first baptism was not valid for whatever reason, and we baptize them then that second time when they ask for it, they're not rebaptized. That's the first baptism. So I don't believe in rebaptism. I believe in baptism. And, and I like I say, and I'll do it a couple of times. Yes, I've done uh, several. And, and and I work on the the. I work on it this way. I'd rather be safe than sorry. And you know your situation better than anybody. More than likely, when you were baptized the first time, you were baptized scripturally, you were baptized correctly, and it was all for the right reasons and 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 scriptural and and everything was correct. As we go back in our memories, our memories are sometimes clouded and confused. I'll use me for a personal example. I was baptized at 12 years of age. I was baptized in the middle of a gospel meeting. Jay Wagan Kilpatrick was holding our meeting at the night which I was baptized. There was nine of us that were baptized. I bless you. Sounded like my sweet wife. It was my sweet wife. Man, I got that one. But uh, uh, there were, do you remember? Because you weren't baptized that night, but there were like, is either five girls and four boys or four girls? and Anyways, four and five. I remember that. And I remember then about 16 or so, 17. I remember one night just laying in bed, just crying. My mama came in and talked to me. What's the problem? I don't know if what I did was right. And I knew what I was doing. And my mother said, son, you knew long before. And she went and carried me back through my history and everything. And I realized, yeah, I knew what was going on. But my memory had gotten clouded. And that sometimes happens. But I'd rather, number one, be safe than sorry. Number two, I'd rather, you know, quash any possibilities. Uh, and I'd also like to allay anybody's uh, thinking guilt or or just you know upset and so like i say i don't think it's a rebaptism and i explained that but i will baptize somebody for a second time i will not practice the mormon practice of first corinthians 15 be baptized for the dead uh, i know we know a girl that how many times she tell us she was baptized she was mormon before she was a member of the church how many she told us how many times she was baptized because she was baptized for the dead. And uh, that is a practice that the Mormons practice. And uh, I'll do that. But I will baptize somebody a second time. Anything else? Probably got more questions out there than I answered. And uh, maybe I answered some. And I hopefully, like I say, I won't be here next week. Uh, Y'all pray for me. But in two weeks. And uh, and by the way, I'm not, as far as I know, I, I've got no problems. The doctor, the, the nurse, when she took my information, she said, uh, she said, well, why are you here to get a colonoscopy? And I said, because I reached the magical age of 60. And she said, oh, OK. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing it. And uh, but anyway, anything else? Y'all are quiet. OK, well, thank you. all Let's have a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Our Father in heaven. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the blessing of it. Thankful for the opportunity to study your word and for your word and what it means to us and to our lives. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us. That we will always try to look to you for guidance, for strength, for help, for comfort. And that we will always live the life that you would have us to live. We ask that you be with those that Jay mentioned that were sick and going through difficult times we also ask that you be with others that maybe we don't know of right now or others that maybe we know of that others don't but we ask that you bless them and keep them be with us watch over us bless us and hold us as we hold to you for this is our prayer in christ's name amen y'all have a great great week thank y'all